Welcome to Thank God It's Friday. This week we are in a conversation with Mark Farber, the editor and publisher of the Gloom, Boom and Doom Report. Uh, Mark, welcome back. What's your view on the state of the US economy and do you believe that the Fed is in a position to start unwinding its balance sheet in 2017? Well, I think that uh, the economy is basically weakening. We have car sales that are essentially down year on year. The housing market is not, has been strong, but now housing uh, sales are also weakening. And uh, loan growth has slowed down considerably. Uh, consumption is sluggish. Restaurant receipts are all down year on year and since 2015. And of course now in the fourth quarter, we'll have the reconstruction from the Hurricane Harvey. So maybe there is going to be a slight pickup. But if you look, say, at the 10 years Treasury yield, uh, at the beginning of the year, many strategists who had been bullish about Treasury bonds, they turned bearish and they were forecasting a 10 years yield of 3% by mid-year or towards the end of the year. And here we are today at 2.12%. So the 10 years bond, government bond in the U.S., would rather suggest that the economy is weakening and not strengthening. Mark, it is uh, increasingly uh, becoming of concern that inflation is falling short of uh, target across the world and not just in US. What could be the implications of all of this for the policies of various central banks? Well, I think it's very good that inflation actually uh, is not accelerating. In fact, I wished we had deflation because one of the problems, uh, both for the US and other countries in the Western world, but also here in Asia and in emerging economies, is that asset prices have gone up so much and the cost of living has gone up very substantially and squeezes the real spending power of the typical household. This I've maintained for a long time in discussions, particularly regarding India, where people have been arguing for years, well, the Reserve Bank of India is too tight, should ease more. But very few people in India own stocks. <laughs> and uh, what is important is the stability of the Indian rupee and to increase the purchasing power of people so they can spend more and improve their standards of living. By having inflation, yeah, home prices go up and then most people can't afford them or insurance premiums go up and then most people can't afford to pay the insurances, then health care costs go up and educational costs go up and so forth. So you don't get a strong economy. What you really need is to improve the affordability of things and say there are some bright spots. Say you look at Amazon.com in the US, they've really lowered the cost of purchasing all kinds of goods for the typical household. So that is a very good thing this kind of deflation that improves uh, the purchasing power of people. So I'm not worried about it, but of course the Fed, uh, they would like to see inflation and even more inflation because uh, they have a completely wrong view about economics. Mark, over the past three months, what we've noticed is that in relation to China, the institutional flows for markets such as India and Thailand have reduced substantially, whereas those for China in equity and bonds have stuck around. How do you see these markets in terms of pecking order in your preference and what are the advantages and disadvantages of each of these markets? 
Well, I, I think uh, the beauty about Asia in terms of being an active manager is that markets do not move all in concert. There are some markets that are strong, like let's take the Indian market. It bottomed out in uh, uh, 2013 in September at uh, around 17,000 on the index. And since then, it's up more than 80%. Many other markets since 2013, 2014 are actually down. And so India had a huge move. This wasn't the case for China until recently. Recently, China has been picking up. The economy looks slightly better at the present time because there's also a massive injection of liquidity, both through the government and through the banking sector. And so suddenly now uh, investors are realizing, well, maybe we've been too bearish about China. Yes, they have a credit bubble, so, but so does the whole world. And maybe the Chinese credit bubble can kind of be managed. Uh, whereas in other countries, the credit bubble may be a bigger problem, particularly with respect to pension funds and unfunded liabilities. So uh, the money is suddenly flowing into China. And I have to say, I'm not bullish, bullish about China. But more than a year ago, I started recommending Macau gaming stocks as a play on the Chinese recovery. And most of these stocks have almost doubled in price. And more recently, I increased my positions in China. I had some stocks, but I've increased the position because I think that money flows uh, will shift uh, from other countries in Asia into China. Mark, what's your view on the Narendra Modi government in India and its reform agendas? And do you expect to see more hard-hitting reforms coming from this government? Well, in principle, the intentions are good. But the intentions of Mr. Trump are also good. But he can't really do very much because of Congress. And we have to realize that the government has also huge obstacles to overcome and uh, that uh, his policies cannot be implemented right away and successfully. And in particular, what has been disappointing in the case of India is that capital spending hasn't really picked up much. That uh, is a puzzle to me. Why? capital spending is still relatively weak. Now, I may say that capital spending in other countries is also weak, but it is, for instance, very strong in Vietnam and in Cambodia and in parts of China. So that is uh, somewhat of a disappointment for me. All right. Uh, the GDP growth in India has been slowing down. The banking system is uh, grappling with bad loans. And uh, now there is a new worry that economic growth is not creating enough jobs. Uh, is there anything about the macros in India that worries you? Well, I have argued for years that, uh, you know, I would rather be invested in India than in the United States. But I have also pointed out that uh, it's actually a miracle that India actually grows at all, given the horrific and uh, horrific bureaucracy India has. This is now really a case where it's a miracle that India grows at all, given the bureaucracy that it has. I had to do with Indian bureaucrats, I tell you, uh, this is about the worst you can encounter in the whole world. Mark, so what have you done with your uh, Indian portfolio holdings in the last one or two months? Um, have you booked profits? Have you in added positions? No, I hold Indian equities through the India Capital Fund, which is run by my friend John Thorne. And uh, aside from that, 
uh, as I've mentioned before, I would be in India more interested in real estate, not in the major cities, but in secondary locations and in resort areas, because I think as India becomes more affluent, and I've seen this in Europe, people will have second homes, uh, they will have beach houses, they have uh, homes in the mountains, uh, where in summer it's cooler, and so forth. So these are things I would do. Uh, we've seen, actually, that uh, some real estate stocks have done fantastically well recently. I mean, India bulls is up something like five times in just a few months. It's not quite as strong as cryptocurrencies, but nevertheless, it's a very strong performance. So I, I think that real estate and real estate related is still attractive. All right, Mark. So, you know, in the past, in the very recent past, you've also said that while benchmark indices may remain more or less at the same levels, you will start seeing new leaders, uh, start, you know, come about. Which, what are these avenues? Where are these areas or sectors that you foresee that could be the next leaders for tomorrow? Well, I mean, first of all, uh, I'm not an uh, expert on uh, Indian investments per se. I'm an economist and a global fund manager. And so India is not uh, the main focus of my activity. For that, I have managers uh, like the India Capital Fund that will select stocks individually. So I think you better ask uh, this question regarding uh, uh, India specifically to an Indian stock picker uh, like Rakesh Chunjavala or so, who <laughs> <laughs> are more familiar with Indian stocks than I am. But if you ask me about the world, I think that uh, we had a very strong performance uh, of technology and internet-related stocks, e-commerce and so forth. They have had a superb performance until recently. Now, more recently, it is so-called, in the U.S., they call them Fang, uh, Facebook, Amazon, Apple, Googles, uh, and so forth, and Netflix, that these kind of stocks they will not provide you a high return going forward. I think they'll go down, actually. They're quite vulnerable. Uh, first of all, there will be more competition, also international competition. And secondly, I think that the valuations are, are extremely high. But if we look at uh, sectors that have a low valuation, I would say oil and oil-related stocks are relatively low. I'd say European stocks are relatively low compared to the U.S. And I'd say some Asian markets, Singapore, Thailand, Vietnam, are relatively low compared to everything else, as well as Japan. And then we have the mining sector. The mining sector has had a horrific performance since 2011. And, you know, the speculators are nowadays no longer in gold, silver, and <laughs> platinum. They all migrated to cryptocurrencies. But I think that the gold sector is kind of bottoming out. I think it's a very different type of asset class to own physical gold than to own uh, bitcoins and other cryptocurrencies. And I think that this sector will come back, as well as the underlying shares. Say, I would be looking also in India at Vendata. I think there is some potential in mining in India uh, that hasn't been tapped yet. Again, because of your regulation and because of your bureaucracy. <laughs> Right, Mark, you know, you, you just touched upon gold to a certain extent. I want your view on gold. And also, you've recently spoken about certain other agricultural commodities that may be priced at a lower level. Uh, what are these commodities? Well, first of all, uh, the question 
relates to essentially two items, uh, precious metals, gold, and then other commodities. I think that uh, gold has uh, bottomed out about uh, one and a half years ago in December 2015. And then we had a strong performance in 2016. Then we came back. And at the end of last year, we were again at the relatively low level and stocks were depressed. And since then, actually, uh, the gold mining ETF, the GDX, is up by more than 18% vis-a-vis the S&P, which is up by 9%. So basically, and the many gold shares that are up between 30 and 300%. So in my view, uh, the media in the U.S. has a very strong bias uh, for fang and fang-related stocks. I presume <laughs> that these are also companies that have large advertising budgets. Uh, the mining sector he does not obtain or receive the necessary attention from the media in the U.S. And so people don't know how well actually gold shares have performed. Say, you take American Barrick and uh, Newmont Mining and uh, Freeport Mountain, these are big companies. December 2015 to today, they're up maybe three, four hundred percent. So that people don't talk about. They talk about Google and they talk about Amazon and so forth. But the strong performance of actually mining companies over the last two, three years is uh, not mentioned. Now, they had a big move just recently because gold broke out above 1300 dollars an ounce. Uh, so they, they are near term overbought. But I think that uh, any investor, when he thinks through, and especially if he goes and looks at some pictures of Jackson Hole, here in Jackson Hole, you encounter the typical group thinking phenomenon. Yellen, Draghi, Kuroda, talking together. And of course, they coordinate monetary policies. And of course, they will print more money in the long run. So the purchasing power of paper money is going down. And so I would own some gold. Now, the new thing is, of course, these cryptocurrencies. <laughs> that is a wonderful thing. Because why do we have cryptocurrencies? We have them, actually because an increasing number of people don't trust paper money anymore, and they don't want money that is controlled by these central banks that pollute Jackson Hole. Right, Mark. Well, we've got uh, what, it, uh, what you've been telling us about. Thank you very much for your time. It was a pleasure speaking with you. <laughs> I'm not sure it's a pleasure, but thank you for the interview. Thank you.